we are in a series called Redeeming Sexuality. And, um, you know, this series is uh, it's a series that we've been working towards for many years. Uh, you know, in, in one reason, honestly, it's out of a response to culture. There's certain times that um, things need to be talked about in a straightforward manner, in a, in a consistent, logical pattern, in order for us as the church to know what we believe, why we believe it, and how to defend it. And uh, whenever I say defend it, I don't mean uh, to be defensive, all right? A lot of people, whenever you, you talk about being uh, defending your faith, it has, it's charged with this defensive, emotional, angry, slam your fist on the table type of attitude, but that's not the type of attitude that we're approaching the subject with, and I don't believe it's the type of attitude that the church should portray. Uh, I, I believe that we do a, a bad job of portraying that attitude. I say we collectively. Um, and what happens is, in an effort for some people, some, some believers, to not come across defensive or offensive, they just, they just have no back backbone whatsoever. And they give in to the current cultural narrative and the cu current cultural interpretation of Scripture, not holding fast to traditional interpretations of Scripture. And then we end up in this big spectrum of belief and interpretation and methodology when it comes to church. And everybody's saying that they're hearing from God uh, equally, but it looks very different, right? Right? And, uh, and so what we're doing is talking about that very honestly, and um, uh, many of you have come back, so that's a good sign. Um, <laughs> see, as, as a preacher, sometimes you, uh, you, you have these weird dreams. Um, I, I don't know, maybe some of you have had a dream like this where uh, you're up and, and you're, you're talking to a lot of people. Maybe like you have a big business meeting or like some sort of uh, you know, thing, presentation you have to give, and maybe you have this dream that... Maybe you say one thing wrong, or just out of nowhere, all of a sudden, everybody just starts getting up and leaving. Anybody ever had that weird dream? You know, you're like, you're giving the speech at school, and all of a sudden, all of your classmates just are just like, this is horrible, and they just get up and walk out, you know? Sometimes as a pastor, you have dreams like that, and you know, so it's always nice when people show back up, but anyway. No, I'm not really that nervous about it, because I am very confident what the Word of God says. And so, yeah, so we've been... Um, We've been approaching these topics again with a lot of, uh, a lot of confidence and a lot of boldness in, in regards to what the Word of God says, but also with a lot of sensitivity because this is where a lot of people uh, live. And so with that, what I want to do is I want to pray, and I want to pray that God would, uh, would guide my words today and also open our minds uh, to, to really understand what His Word is speaking to us. So Lord, we submit this time to you. God, we thank you for your Word that we have in our hands today, that we can read to understand your heart, to understand the way that you think and the way that you've created us. And Lord, I pray that today that we would embrace that, that we would embrace your design, and that God, we would not just embrace a doctrine or a dogma, but Lord, that we would embrace your heart, that we would uh, have an understanding of the way that you think and the way that you are God, that we would not just uh, absorb information, but Lord, that we would absorb your spirit, the spirit of the law, the spirit of the word that would guide our steps, uh, convict us, and, uh, and bring life and hope today in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. So we believe that God created everything. And, and some of you could probably say what we're about to say right here, right now, because you've heard every intro of this sermon, right? But, but we believe that God created everything. Genesis 1 verse 31 says, and God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. It was whole. It was, um, it was full of integrity. It was optimal for human flourishing, okay? That's what that word means. It's shalom. It was good. And he created everything, including our sexuality, and whenever I say sexuality, it's, it's kind of a, an umbrella word that kind of encompasses the things that we've talked about over the last few weeks, uh, biological sex, gender identity, and then today we're going to be talking about sexual orientation. And the thing is, is that in the garden, Adam and Eve, their sexuality was whole, all right? And so all of these things were aligned, but then sin fractured the world. And part of what sin fractured is our sexuality. 
Sin fractured our bodies, sin fractured our minds, and sin fractured the way that we see other people, all right? And so sexuality, again, is one of those ways that, that, sin, has affected, um, that sin has affected our sexuality. Now, we say redeeming sexuality. The word redeem means to free from the consequences of sin, okay? So whenever we say that Jesus came to redeem all of creation, we believe that Jesus came to redeem, to free the world from the consequences of sin. Now, Jesus has paid the price, okay? Sin, the, the power of sin and death in the grave has been broken. However, we still are living in a time where we're experiencing the fallout of sin. And so what a lot of times people are looking for is heaven, utopia. Why are things so messed up? And Because we're looking forward to heaven. And so for me, as I look out at all the brokenness of the world, I'm always reminded at the same time that there is a future hope and glory. And it's not fully realized right now, but it is already done. We just don't see it yet. Does that kind of make sense? All right, so, so we're in this in-between. We're in this tension. And so each week we are discussing how sin has fractured specific categories of sexuality and how Jesus redeems these parts of our lives. And so we've discussed that despite cultural understandings of these things, that the Bible supports two biological sexes, male and female, and two gender identities based on that biological sex, man and woman. Now, that statement in and of itself is a large statement if this is your first message that you've heard um, and you are in the cultural debates of all of these things, I'd highly encourage you to go back and listen to the first two weeks of the series. And even last week, we talked about redeeming masculinity, all right, which is, I thought it was another great week. And so anyway, uh, but this is kind of what we've discussed. And so, uh, but also in addition to these two parts of our, our, ourselves, our, our, our bodies, our biological sex, and, and gender identity and kind of the way that the world looks at it. Also, our affections and attractions are also fractured. And this is called sexual orientation. And this is, this is sort of the cultural definition of this word. Sexual orientation refers to the enduring pattern of emotional, romantic, and or sexual attractions to men, women, both neither or more than one gender. And with this, one thing I failed to say that I would like to say now is that if you do have a young person in the room that uh, you, would, you feel like today might be uh, ab above maybe what sh they should hear, we have a wonderful kids ministry uh, all, the way, all the way through. Oh, there it is. Look at there. Boom. All the way through uh, 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 age 11. And so if, if you choose to uh, get up now and find one of our host members to find, you will not be judged, and we will support that. Uh, one time I was, um, I kind of gave that, that warning, that caution, and um, it was like, I don't know, 30 minutes into the message, and I really got into the message, you know, sort of saying some things that, um, I don't know, a nine-year-old might not need to hear, and then somebody got up and was like, hurrying out with our kid. I was like, I'll wait. I'll give it 10 more seconds. Okay, boom. And then we went back into it. But anyway, um, this is sexual orientation. It's, it's who someone is attracted to, uh, physically, emotionally, who they're attracted to. And, and you know, the, the next part there where it said, the last part of it where it said uh, to, to men, women, both, neither, or more than one gender, whenever we say more than one gender, that is uh, more of it, that's kind of a newer part of that definition culturally, because where there used to be two genders, again, I'm kind of going back to week two on this one, now we live in a world that says that there are upwards of, I don't know, 200 genders now, and uh, it's just really getting out of control. And so, uh, uh, not saying that I believe that, but just saying that that's, again, the cultural. That's one other thing I'd like to kind of preface because, again, I realize some of you, it might be your first time, uh, is that not everything, not every definition that I read and everything that I say, am I, am I really saying that I agree completely with that take? What I am saying, though, is that we must understand the conversations that are going on in our culture in order to understand the, the podcasts and the interviews and the conversations and the blog and the articles and everything that we read and intake, because if we don't understand the language, then we don't understand the conversation. Does that make sense? Good. Glad. Okay. Overwhelming, overwhelming uh, agreement there. Okay. Um, <laughs> 
The world says this, you love who you love. You love who you love. And this in, in, in acting out of who you love and, and operating in that, that, that is the, the ultimate freedom, right? That you, if, if whoever you love, love them uh, romantically, be involved in them, marry whoever you want to marry, do whatever you want to do, and that's the ultimate place of freedom and also identity. Again, we discussed this a lot this, this month, that, that our world finds their, their highest form of expression in their sexuality whenever it's not supposed to be like that, okay? And so, but we have you know, generations of people that have come up believing that their highest form of identity is their sexuality. And so it promotes, our culture promotes this sexual liberation, be free in who you are, do what you want to do with whoever you want to do it with, and you're going to really find yourself in that place. So our, our culture celebrates sexual liberation as opposed to sexual abstinence. The A word, abstinence. I always find it interesting that a culture will celebrate something and put a lot of money into something and then say that to celebrate and to promote the other side is just too difficult. For instance, we spend, what, billions of dollars every year in our culture, probably more than that, promoting sexual liberation, and we say that we don't have enough money or energy or marketing to promote sexual abstinence. So in school, we'll promote safe sex rather than no sex. You know what I'm talking about? And I mean, for a lot of us, safe sex, I mean, that's so old, it's like... It's barely even promoted anymore, right? I mean, we, we, I mean, years ago, I was talking to somebody about this, and uh, we got into abortion, we got into the whole, the whole conversation, and I, I brought up abstinence, and they literally just laughed at me. I was like, what? Like, people are not going to abstain. I'm like, we tell people not to murder each other. Like, we put a lot of energy into that. How about we put the same amount of energy into promoting, like, sexual, you know, healthy sexuality, no, no, we can't do that. Why? Because we want to do what we want to do. That's why. It really, in a lot of ways, it comes down to something as simple as that. Now, traditional views of sexuality have been mocked and replaced, and things are acceptable now that weren't acceptable even 10 years ago. But should traditional sex ex, uh, uh, sexual ethics be abandoned for modern ones? Is that what should happen? And, uh, you know, well, like, like we've said every week, uh, for Christians, and this is kind of where I, I tilt the conversation. For Christians, it isn't about what the world thinks, but it's about what the word says. All right? And so this sermon and, and this series is not 100% for those who don't believe in the word of God, who don't believe in God altogether. Uh, that, that's not really, we're not giving an apologetic for that. Okay? We're not giving a reason, a, a, a defense for how we believe for, for people who don't believe that the word of God is not the word of God, all right? We've done other series on that, but today we're starting with the, the standpoint that, that we as people believe that there is a God and believe that, that the Bible that we have is his word given to us to direct us, to direct our societies and to communicate to, uh, to us what his design is, what God's design is for us, and to live in that, in that way. So that's for us, we look at the word of God. So a biblical worldview says that God designed sex and that we flourish in his design, not our desires. In the beginning, God made man and woman, Genesis 2, 24. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. All right? This is the first mention of marriage, what we would call marriage. And this is in Genesis. And the pattern is that a man and a woman meet, that they develop affection and pure sexual attraction for each other. Then they enter into the sacred covenant of marriage, and they have children. This is the pattern. I got a bug that's literally flying around me right now. Does anybody else see that? Is it just me? Awesome. I, and yeah, I don't know if it just flew in my eye too. Like literally, this thing is like going nuts. Nobody else saw that. Good. Awesome. I was trying to hold it together and it was just like, <sighs> man. All right. Let me back up. I don't even know what I just said. I was just like, 
Sheesh, man. All right, all right. This is the first mention of marriage in Genesis. All right, a, a man and a woman meet. They develop an affection and a pure sexual attraction for each other. And then they enter into the sacred covenant of marriage, and they have children. This pattern, this antiquated, old school, traditional pattern, all right, this is God's design in scripture. And it is still the best design for human flourishment. I'm telling you, it's still the best design for a child to be raised up in a home with a mother and a father. It still is. Now, I realize that there's a whole lot of reasons why that doesn't take place, and some of which are beyond our control. There's, there's death. There, there's all sorts of reasons. And so I, if you, if you didn't, weren't raised up in that design, in that, in that pattern, um, if you're not in that pattern right now, I'm not saying this to condemn you, but come on, y'all. There's a lot of things that happen, but we can still point to what is God's design, right? Okay? So sin fractured God's design. It's turned, nowadays, it, it, it's turned marriage and sex from acts of sacred worship to selfish fulfillment. And it's caused so many societal issues, y'all. So many societal issues. And despite the societal issues that it's caused, culture still promotes patterns not aligned with God's design. This is how I, I, I see it. Have, has anybody in here ever lied before? Right? That's one of those questions, absolutely. And you know what's weird about whenever you say a lie? You feel like it's the last one you're gonna have to say in order to like seal up that situation. Things hit the fan, you're like, my easy way out is just to lie. And then it's good. But what happens? You lie once and you are going to have to lie again. And then you're gonna have to lie again and remember the other two lies in order to say another good lie. And then it's a domino effect and eventually, everything hits the fan, right? All the dominoes fall, and you're left there, and everybody knows you're a liar. But you think that you'll be able to correct what you've broken. What I see society do is it's broken away from the pattern that God has set, and now we're reeling from that, and now we're trying to come up with different ways to fix what is broken. You all with me on that? And the dominoes are just falling. So Christians follow the Bible's pattern. But many question how the Bible is interpreted and if it's relevant today. So let's look at some scripture to understand the Bible's sexual ethic. That's what we're going to do. We're going to look at scripture to see what the Bible says to us about the right way. We're going to use 1 Corinthians 6 as this example today. I'm going to read it and then we'll kind of say some things about it. Verse 9, Paul is writing this to the church in Corinth, and he says, Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. Has anybody got a, some water? Give me some of that water right there. I forgot to bring my water today. Thanks, man. It's all good. Yeah. You not been sick lately? Good. These scriptures are very straightforward in what we read. However, there's a lot of debate about what these scriptures are really saying. And it's important that we take time to look at what these verses are saying, what these words are in order to understand the current cultural conversations that are happening. So we're gonna take the, 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 the parts of this scripture that are, that are talking about sexual immorality and discuss those, but I do wanna take a moment and bring attention to verse 10 where it says, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, or swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And, and I, would, I would like to, to bring attention to the fact that Paul is confronting a plethora of sin. And so in this series, this is redeeming sexuality, so we're talking about sexuality, but scripture is very clear that there are many reasons why people will not inherit the kingdom of God, all right? And so uh, we, could, we, could, we could have a long conversation about 
thieves and, and, and the greedy and drunkards and revilers and swindlers and how sin is prevalent in their lives and what it looks like. And so today is not to pick on those who fall into the, the, the sexually immoral category, okay? But we're focusing in on that today, all right? Sexual immorality is the first thing that Paul deals with in regards to sexuality. And this word for sexual immoral is a word that means fornication. Any sexual activity outside the covenant of marriage between a man and a woman. All right, this is an umbrella word, sexually immoral. And this word fornication, I mean, the word fornication in and of itself is, is kind of made fun of nowadays, right? It's like, oh, fornicator, you know, it's like, but it is a word in scripture that, that still matters today. In this word also, it, it, uh, it encompasses prostitution, but, but overall, it encompasses any sexual activity outside the covenant of marriage, all right? And the thing about sex outside of marriage is that in the past, it was looked down upon. It was culturally considered something that you shouldn't do, even though a lot of people still did it. Y'all, come on. You know what I'm talking about? It was not as culturally, it wasn't celebrated as much. My parents are in their 70s, and, and uh, whenever they were raised up, I mean, that was something that you kept quiet. You know what I'm saying? You didn't do that. Or you didn't talk about it. You didn't brag about it. You know what I'm talking about? And, and then all of a sudden through the 60s and, and culturally, things begin to change. And it went from that's not mainstream to it's weird if you don't. Nowadays, it's just assumed. It's just assumed. Like if you're dating, you're sleeping together. But guess what? It's not supposed to be like that. In the world, y'all, I'm not even talking about in the world. I'm talking about in the church, y'all. <laughs> like, it's, and I'll, I'll say this. Some people, we're at a point where some people don't even know that it's wrong. I've sat with people who are about to get married and talked to them about this and the look of surprise on their face. They're like, I've literally never heard this in my life. And so for some, that's where you fall. You're like, I didn't know. I, I still didn't know till this moment reading this that that's what that means. And so there's something happening in you already that's like, man, I got, I got to change the way that I think. Other people, they know good and well what the word of God says, but they disregard it. Why? Because culturally, it's just so acceptable. But there is a difference between how the church operates and how the world operates, right? So that's the first word. The second word is adulterers, okay? Nor adulterers. Now, if you notice, right before adulterers, there's idolaters. If you go back a couple of weeks, we actually talked about how a part of worshiping false gods was a, a large part of it was actually a lot, a lot of sexual acts. Okay, they did a lot of sexual things, and that was part of their worship. So Paul is confronting sexual immorality. He's also confronting idolatry. But it says here, nor adulterers. And these are, y'all know what adultery is, man. Y'all know, know what that is. It's people who cheat on each other after they're married. Cheaters. How many of y'all like that show? Cheaters. <laughs> when I say cheaters, I automatically see the logo, you know? Come on. It's drama. You know, there's a lot of people nowadays who have sort of like jumped over, leapfrogged adultery and they've gone into just open marriages. And for a lot of you, you might not realize how prevalent open marriages are nowadays, but it's a big deal. It's all over the place. It's also in the church. This idea that as long as we both agree that we can kind of go out and sleep with whoever we want, we're still married, we're still in covenant together. Or we can venture out together with other people. And for some of you, you're like, I could never, I can't imagine. For others of you, maybe that's your story or you understand exactly what I'm talking about. I would say that adultery is not just about cheating. It's also just about having sexual activity outside of, of, of your marriage covenant with one other person, with other people. And so for some of you, you're like, well, we're not cheating on each other, so it's okay. No, that's not the design. But adultery, cheating on each other, look, it's in the Ten Commandments. 
Adultery's been around a long time, and God frowned upon it then, and he still frowns upon it now. It's not a part of God's design. And I would say this, though. The large part of culture still does agree that you shouldn't cheat on somebody you're married to. Right? They would say that about somebody you're just dating. You shouldn't go out on the person that you're dating. And so in our culture, we generally have a, a soft spot in our heart for that. Like we, we, Even if you don't believe in the Bible, you're like, hey, you shouldn't do that. Now, I think it's funny when people don't believe in some sort of moral standard, but yet they'll say a moral standard. <laughs> Whole other thing there. That's fun. Uh, the third thing, where we want to spend most of our time today is talking about this, this, this next word, homosexuality. Homosexuality is practicing sexual relations with someone of the same sex. And this is the major contention in our society. This is where the rubber really meets the road. This is where there's a lot of contention. Until the 1960s, homosexuality was culturally unacceptable. And what I mean by that is it's mainstream. Okay, it was mainstream unacceptable. You could, you could go back and you could watch old videos from the 50s and the 60s and how they would talk about uh, homosexuality. And it was honestly, it was, it was just really wrong. It was, homosexuals were treated extremely poorly in our country, really all over the world, um, uh, made out to be uh, just uh, freaks. Honestly, and, and many of you guys know the history of homosexuality and how people were treated, and uh, it, it, it was inhumane. And so uh, it was culturally unacceptable, but we see a massive change in our culture in the last 60 years, 50, 60 years. We see a cultural shift where homosexuality went from being something that everybody, generally speaking, frowned upon to where in 2015, same-sex marriage was legalized and, and celebrated. And, I mean, I think that should kind of teach us how quickly our society changes. And I think it's only going to get quicker and quicker. I think in the last five years, you can see how quickly uh, a cultural mindset, how quick it can change. And the Internet has really um, mitigated a lot of that, that time. It's, it's shortened the time span between an idea being introduced into a society and then being absorbed and implemented and even the legal system following that, okay? So we live in a time where things move quick. And so same-sex marriage is, is legalized, and, and here we are. And it seems in our culture and in the church for a lot of people, the debate is sort of over. Like, hey, homosexuality is, is accepted and absorbed into our society, also into the church. Man, we've progressed to a place where we can finally love each other and accept one another for who we are and affirm each other just like Jesus did. What we're talking about right here, and we've said this a couple times this month, is splitting our society, and it's also splitting the church. We have mainline denominations who are choosing sides and, and, and going one way or the other. We have pastors who are stuck in the middle who don't really know where to go, how to talk about these things. Us talking about this right here uh, is a no-go. It's like a, a, a danger zone for many churches and um, and I believe we need to really talk about this specifically because homosexuality is still a big deal. Scripturally, it's still a big deal. Now, here's the deal, guys. Culture may shift, but the word of God doesn't. So here's where the crux is. How do we interpret this scripture and other scriptures? Because what's going on and the reason that churches are splitting, it's not because of opinion necessarily. It's not really only because of culture. It's actually because of how you interpret the word of God. And how we interpret the word of God here at Northwood Church has determined our stance in the way that we believe and the way that we operate in this, uh, in this regard. And so why is there such a debate about homosexuality in the church? Doesn't the Bible just say it right there? That's what a lot of people do. They're like, man, it's so simple. First Corinthians, it says homosexual. Why are we still talking about this? It's so clear. Well, there's a couple of arguments about this. And number one, the first argument is that the word homosexual isn't even in the Bible. And for those of you who 
believe, kind of think the way that I just said that, you're like, it's right there. Just read the Bible. Well, actually, the word homosexual uh, wasn't in a Bible translation until the 1940s because the word didn't exist till the 1800s. The word just didn't exist. Heterosexual, homosexual, those words didn't exist. They were actually, it was uh, created by a Hungarian journalist and human rights campaigner, Carl Maria Benkert. And so the Bible, in case you didn't know, was written a lot, like a long time before the 1800s. And so how could a word that didn't exist have, have been put in there? Well, since the Bible doesn't use modern day language, terminology, a lot of people are like, hey, it's, man, now it's all, uh, it's all open to interpretation, which kind of goes into the second argument that the Greek words, which is what the New Testament was written in, that the Greek words interpreted as referring to homosexuality aren't about consensual monogamous same-sex relationships, but about non-consensual or exploitative relationships including things like pedophilia. And so this is where the things begin to kind of split, is that people will say, well, you have to go study the culture at the time, and you have to understand what Paul is confronting at the time in order to really understand that he's not talking about consensual same-sex relationships, but he's talking about uh, uh, non-consensual, exploitative Rape, pedophilia, prostitution, forced prostitution, that, that's what he's talking about. And this is where things begin to differ. Because here's the deal, if Paul is just talking about that, and scripture is just talking about the things that we all agree that nobody should be taken advantage of, if that's what he's talking about, then it, it sh- all restraints should be removed. And we should embrace homosexuality fully, and celebrate it as part of God's design. But if Paul's not talking about that, then we have to approach it differently. The words used to describe describe homosexuality are from the Greek words malakoi and arsenikoitis. Arsenikoitai. And and y'all listen, these words have been interpreted 28 different ways. All right? And um, I don't know how many of you have actually really taken the hours and the time it takes to read the books and study and and go back in history and and really look at all this. But it comes down to how you interpret these two words that then says what route you're taking. This is it. This is the red hot moment. So in the context of this verse, Malakoi refers to soft or effeminate. And if you go read other scriptures, you'll see, or other uh, translations, like the King James, you'll see the word effeminate put in there. That, that's this word malakoi. And we actually talked about this a couple of weeks ago, but this also refers to men. This refers to men who would dress and act as women. And in some cases, they would castrate themselves to look like women. And it was usually for sexual reasons. All right, again, we're not going to go very deep into this. If you'd like, you can go back to week two when we talked about gender identity. Uh, these types of situations, first off, they've been happening for a very long time. Going, going back to, I mean, as, as soon as you could begin to read about human history, you see people that, uh, that live life like this, all right? So also, sometimes what you have to do is say, okay, the word says this, uh, uses this word malakoi. It's, it's, not, it's not mentioned a lot in scripture in this, types of, uh, this type of context. So what you also have to do is go to other books of antiquity in that time and read how other people would use that word. I kind of used this illustration before. If I say the word spring right now, you don't know whether I'm talking about the season. You don't know whether I'm talking about somebody jumping, right, like springing into action. Uh, you don't know if I'm talking about a metal coil Because that word spring, how I'm using it is determined by the context of the words around it. And so here we know that Paul is not talking about a soft blanket. Where malakoi might be used to describe something soft in another book, like Luke or something like that. Paul, that wouldn't be Paul saying that, but I'm saying the word is being used in different parts of scripture. We know he's not talking about a a soft blanket 
or like soft clothing as in another uh, use of the word malakoi. Because in context, we know what he's describing. And that's what a lot of people miss, first off, is you have to understand what the culture is saying and how other people use the word, like the first century historian Philo of Alexandria. He uses the word malakoi like Paul does here to refer to that. You can go look up Special Laws 3, 37 through 42, and go read how, uh, how Philo describes homosexual activity. He describes what seems to be a transgender, people that are living a transgender lifestyle, what we would call transgender lifestyle. He's describing all of these things, and he's not celebrating it. He's saying it's not how it should be. So... Uh, that's just a few mentions of that word malakoi. Arsenicoitis or arsenicoitai is a compound word that's also used in 1 Corinthians, 1 Timothy. It's also used in Leviticus 18 and 20, which for a lot of you are like, well, you know, it's not a Greek. The Old Testament was written in, in Hebrew. Yes, but there's this, this uh, interpretation called the, uh, it's a Greek translation called the Septuagint, and you can go and see how this word arsenokoitai is used in the Septuagint, and it's a compound word that refers to men who have sex with other men, right? Now, not only do these verses describe homosexuality, but also verses of scripture like in Romans chapter one. Go read Romans chapter one. It describes homosexuality. And so we can see that this type of sexual activity wasn't God's design for people because scripture is not, again, celebrating these things. Scripture is saying, is pointing away from these things. Scripture is saying that this is not God's design, even in the use of the, the word arsenokoitai. Now, listen, I want to say this. If you go and Google these two words and you begin to do your own research, which I would say that's fine, go do it. You are going to find people who would interpret these scriptures solely as being non-consensual, exploitative, uh, descriptions of non-consensual, exploitative relationships, sexual activity. You're going to find it easily. Matter of fact, it's probably going to be some of the top things because our culture is pressing this narrative. And our culture is doing a great job of talking about these things. The church lags behind in talking about these things. The world is telling a lot of stories of people who are experiencing liberation in their life in this new identity of, of loving who they want to love and, and enjoying those types of things. Now, the deal is, though, our standard for what is right and righteous is not whether or not we experience happiness by doing those things. Are y'all with me on that? Okay, a Christian worldview says it doesn't matter if me doing something fulfills me. If it is considered sinful in the word of God, it's not a good thing. And that's very difficult for some people to receive. If you would like to go to some, by the way, if you'd like to go do some more research, I would, I would uh, recommend a book, People to Be Loved by Preston Sprinkle. Uh, that's that's um, one resource, and you can look up Preston Sprinkle, actually, their entire website. Uh, they have an entire website. I can't remember the exact uh, URL of it right now. Uh, I should have wrote that down. But anyway, uh, it's, it's a great resource for those of you who would like to go a little bit deeper into that. Uh, some of you are like, nope, I'm good to go. I don't know how to say those words, and that's fine with me. Uh, others of you, though, you'd like to dig deeper, and what I want to say is this. You've got to find biblical resources for that because you, because you could find a lot of people who interpret Scripture, and it's not in what we would call a biblically uh, accurate way. So despite what people say and try to say and culture, what culture's fighting for, the Bible only supports two biological sexes, male and female, two gender identities based on that biological sex, man and woman, and one sexual orientation to be actively engaged in, which is heterosexuality, and only in the context of marriage. That is the scriptural pattern. That is God's design. Now, one question I, wanna, I want you to just think of 
is what if everyone lived that lifestyle? What if our world embraced a sexually moral, a biblically pure sexual ethic? What would this world look like? There would be no sexual abuse, first off. All sexual abuse would cease. All marital infidelity would disappear. Our favorite show, Cheaters, would go out of business. <laughs> It'd be done. Broken homes, in many cases, would no longer be broken. Sex trafficking would disappear. Pornography would dissipate. I mean, th the list goes on and on. And I think if we all imagined a society that operated as the word of God teaches, I think we can all agree that it would be better for society. Why? Because God designed us, and whenever we operate in his design, it is better for us even if it is not always easy for us. Now, uh, I realize this is difficult for a lot of people because of the implications of what this statement and our interpretation of scripture means. For those of you in this room watching online, and then for those of you who have friends or family who deal with same-sex attraction, it's like, well, what does that look like for me? How do I live life in a sexually moral way if I'm dealing with same-sex attraction? How, are you saying that I can't express any sort of romantic love with anyone ever? I, I, I can't in, engage in that? I listened to a... Uh, a guy talked about this just this past week, and he was saying, what Christians don't understand is what they're asking us to do is impossible for us to do. And I, I want to say something like, I do understand that, that telling someone who is a homosexual, who has same-sex attraction, telling them to just stop being attracted to the same sex, it would be like you telling me to be attracted to the same sex. I am a heterosexual male. I am not attracted to men. And so for you to tell me to be attracted to men, it just, it doesn't connect. It do, I can't make that happen. And I, anytime that I talk to someone who is, uh, is dealing with these things, I always tell them that, hey man, listen, I'm not trying to fix you. I'm not trying to change your sexual orientation. I can't do that, all right? I'm not asking you to do that because if you ask me to do that, I, I can't make that happen. So first off, you know, you have, to, you have to kind of start there, which is like, okay, for a lot of, this isn't like a light switch. But I thought that to sort of talk about this from more of a personal standpoint, because I haven't dealt with this personally, would be to share the story of somebody that I know who has walked through this. And they, they don't attend this church, but um, we've been friends for many years. And uh, I just wanted to, I asked them to type out their story so I could read it. And so I just want to share that with you. She said, I grew up in a typical Southern Bible, ba uh, Bible Belt family. Although my family claimed to be Christian, they often used their beliefs to judge others rather than practice genuine faith. My mom left when I was seven, leaving my dad to raise me and my brother. I realized I was attracted to girls in the sixth grade after exploring the internet and finding chat rooms discussing same-sex attraction. This revelation made sense of my childhood experiences where I had deeper, more emotional connections with girls compared to boys. My biggest fear was never finding a partner or being truly loved by my family due to their vocal disapproval of non-heterosexual people. And I found solace in online communities where I could be myself. High school was challenging as I fell in love with a classmate who faced ridicule for being openly lesbian. This environment made coming out difficult and strained my family relationships. After becoming a follower of Jesus, 
I initially believed in the love is love ideology, finding comfort in communities of openly gay Christians. However, this led to internal conflict and regret after same-sex encounters as I felt a heaviness and sadness that I couldn't escape. I decided to focus on my faith in church, finding more validation there. Gradually, I shifted my focus from relationships to aligning my life with biblical teachings. I stopped dating altogether, seeking to honor God with my life and realizing my identity is rooted in being a child of God rather than my sexuality. I've been celibate for about a decade. My relationship with my sexuality has improved as I've distanced myself from societal views and deepened my faith. Despite resistance from some, including Christians, I've embraced my decision to follow God. Leaving, leading a young adults group at my church, I support others struggling with LGBTQ plus issues by encouraging them to root their identity in God. It's the story of someone who has struggled, who has gone through the gambit of biblical interpretation, um, being a part of affirming churches, being a part of, of groups of people who celebrate their free sexuality and pursuing whoever they want to pursue, and who's walked through that, and she experiences conviction from the Holy Spirit. And she's not the only person that I know who has this story. There are many, many, many Christians who deal with same-sex attraction who have the same story. We have some in our church. We have people who have been married. And there was one couple, I'm not gonna go into the full story, but uh, me and another pastor, we met with them. They wanted to meet with us and, and they were married, um, two men who were married and they've been coming to our church for a long time and they wanted to meet. And to be honest with you, I was nervous to meet with them because I didn't know what, like I don't know what we're walking into, you know. Um, whenever we showed up, we sit down, I quickly realized that they were, they were much more nervous to meet with me than I was to meet with them. And we began to talk, and uh, they began to express that they were dealing with, the Holy Spirit was convicting them about their lifestyle. And they were married, and they were, you know, engaging in relation, relation sex and sexual relations and everything. And, and before we even met, three months before we had met, they had already separated themselves sexually. They began to sleep in separate rooms because they were being dealt with, not by somebody, nobody said anything, nobody confronted them. But as they were reading the word and as they were praying, they were like, we're not right. And so one interesting moment in that, in that story, in that conversation was, I said, listen, at our church, we have a traditional view of these things. And I said, obviously, we love you guys. You know, man, God loves you. And, and like, I don't have any ill will towards you at all. We just differ in regards to how we read scripture. And I said, and, and honestly, there's a lot of other churches around here who are affirming churches that obviously we, we disagree with biblically. I got nothing against them. You know, like it's not personal, but it's, it's very biblical. We have a biblical disagreement here. I said, but where there might be some limitations and in, in things here, you could go to those churches and find a church in a community that affirms you and that that you, you'd want to be involved with more. I mean, what am I supposed to say, right? You know, and um, and they they looked at each other. They got very. They kind of like like took a deep breath and they were just like, you know, they looked at each other and, and I was like, what what does that mean? You know, they said, we don't want to go to those churches because they don't tell us the truth. And I realized at that moment that the Holy Spirit, when the Holy Spirit convicts, we don't really have to say a lot as people. We don't. We love people. We communicate truth. We stand on that truth. But you don't have to rant. You don't have to rate. You don't, you don't, have, to, you don't have to pound your fist on the table. Let the Holy Spirit do what the Holy Spirit does. But I can tell you that if, if the Holy Spirit doesn't convict someone, and, and we could broaden this much bigger than just what we're talking about now, if the Holy Spirit doesn't convict someone of something, you cannot convince them of something. And I think a lot of us, we just try to convince people. 
We should try to convince them. And I think we should know what we believe and we should speak it with confidence and boldness and love. But God is God. He's building his church. The gates of hell won't stand a chance against it, right? And, and we stand firm on that. And we love people. So, so that's, that's, that's homosexuality. Now, I want to broaden it as, we, as we're about to close here. The truth is that every Christian has biblical boundaries that they're accountable to no matter their sexual orientation. All right? Every single person in here, every single person that was watching online, we all have biblical boundaries around our sexuality. All right? And so the question is, how do we all live with a redeemed sexuality? What does it look like for all of us to live with a redeemed sexuality? Number one is this, is that we embrace God's design. We embrace God's design. Scripture in 1 Corinthians 6, 13, Paul says this in the same chapter that we were in, that the body is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. I want you to all hear this. You were not created. Your physical body was not created to live a life of sexual immorality. You were not created to live a promiscuous lifestyle. You were not created in your soul to have multiple sexual partners. You weren't. Some of you have never heard that before. Whenever you have sex with someone, it's not just a physical interaction. It is an emotional soul interaction. And, and in the covenant of marriage, it's beautiful because you build a soul tie with one another. Soul ties are wonderful in the right context. Outside of that right context, and we go from person to person to person, we are being torn. And so we were designed to be one with one person. It's not very popular nowadays. How antiquated is that, right? Number two we live with a redeemed sexuality by uh, whenever we resist temptation. Yes, it is a battle to fight sexual immoral thoughts and actions in your life. Anybody agree with me on that? It's a fight. It's a battle. Okay? And we must resist temptation. Paul says it like this in verse 18. Flee from sexual immorality. Flee from it. I mean, Run. Get your cardio in, man. Run from sexual immorality. Every other sin is a person commits is outside of the body, but the sexually immoral person sins against his own body. All sins are the same is what a, a lot of us say. However, there is something about sexual sin that is a little bit different. It's a little bit different. In a lot of ways, it even has far more uh, uh, intense uh, results in our lives. Flee temptation. Number three, lastly, we submit our desires to God's desires. Verse 19 and 20. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? Your body was given to you, was designed by God, and was given to you by God to steward. You are not your own, for you were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. This is what the word of God says about sexuality. And in this series, our goal is not to be argumentative. Our goal was not to hurt anyone, to offend anyone. But I believe that God's design for us is, is just as important. Hey, listen, we all agree that adultery is wrong. We all agree that lying is wrong. We agree that murder is wrong. And I would argue that the same train of thought, the same train of belief and faith in the word of God applies to sexuality. And so today, what I said, if you do disagree, I would say don't disagree with me as a person. Disagree with scripture. Look to scripture and, and dig deeper into what the word of God says. What's amazing is that the church, generally speaking, for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years, if not thousands, collectively with, with uh, Jewish thought, is, has believed in that this is the best design. 
we are in a, in a, in a cultural split, a moment that there is such a temptation to release traditional views on sexuality, but not just sexuality, in many other things. And my encouragement is to seek God. Don't just listen to a podcast. Seek the word of God. Read scripture. Pray that God would reveal his heart to you and then obey what he speaks to you.